Welcome uh, to Automatic Lovers. Should we be worried about sex robots, uh, which is the last session of the battle Sexual Revolution Strand? My name is Elisabetta Gasparoni. I'm a teacher of Italian language and literature and the convener of the Future Cities Project Readers Group, which is a book club with a difference, uh, providing an alternative to the conventional focus on fiction books. It is one of the many activities of the Future Cities Project, an organization uh, that critically explores issues around the city and society, and that uh, today sponsors this session. I am very, very excited about this debate because it grapples, yes, I know, <laughs> it grapples with issues that are discussed a lot in the media. And uh, for those who attended the Strand, some of them were addressed in the previous sessions, like what we want from a relationship, how we define a healthy relationship, and which role has intimacy in sexual interaction. This session wants to explore an even more difficult issue, that is the impact of amorous androids in our lives. In our quest for technology to advance the human experience, tech companies are recreating sexual intimacy. The invention of the first sex robot has started the race for digital sex. And as far as uh, now, four companies are eagerly racing to create robotic lovers and uh, sexual partners. So is this a welcome development? The majority of the arguments in favor of sex robots claim that they protect the vulnerable from men who struggle with intimacy to women trafficked into sex work. Opponents instead raise concerns about promoting a pornified ideal of female sexuality that could intensify existing physical and sexual violence against women and children. So the discourse about robotic relationships seems to point to two opposite visions, the utopian and the dystopian one. But most importantly, it raises a very prescient pres question. Um, will sex as I know, uh, I know it, or some of us know it, uh, <laughs> survive in the 21st centuries? So I'm very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of speaking, speakers to help uh, um, us uh, to navigate these waters, each of, wh of whom is going to speak for five to seven minutes. And uh, their bio is really interesting and long, and so I will keep it to just a few lines. And uh, I, I ask for forgiveness to my speakers, but uh, in order, I introduce them in the order in which they, they are going to speak. The first one is Timandra Harkness, and she is a journalist here on my, yeah, on my left, extreme left. And she is a, a journalist, writer, and broadcaster. She is a regular on BBC Radio 4. She is the, the author of Big Data, Does Size Matter? And as well as data, she speaks and writes on artificial intelligence, robotics, and other topics around our relationship with science and technology. Next uh, to speak um, is uh, Simon Evans. And uh, Simon is a comedian for some uh, 20 years standing. He is now the host of the comedy economics hybrid, Simon Evans Goes to uh, Market, where he looks at the economics behind everything, from sugar to marriage uh, to death, and uh, automatic lovers uh, too. And then uh, the third speaker is uh, here on my right, uh, Dr. Kate, Dr. Kate uh, Devlin. Um, Kate is a senior lecturer in the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London. She works in the fields of human-computer interaction and artificial intelligence and uh, is currently focusing on uh, cognition, sex, gender and sexuality. She has just published a book, the title Turned On Science, Sex and Robots, and is uh, in the bookshop for you to um, have a look and, and buy and read it. It's a very interesting book. And my final speaker is uh, Dr. Pierce Ben on my stream right. And um, is a visiting, Pierce is a visiting lecturer in philosophy at the University of London. His interests focus on ethics, philosophy, 
of uh, Religion, Toleration and Philosophy of Psychiatry. He was the producer and chair of a very thought-provoking uh, session, the third one of this strand, entitled Is Porn Corrupting Sex? So give a round of applause, please, and let's start. Kimandla. <laughs> It's slightly hard to find myself here. Uh, first of all, I, I didn't have any opinions on sex robots at all until we made a radio programme in the Future Proofing series, which is about ideas that shape the future, and the idea we were looking at was intimacy. So the question was, what's the future of intimacy? And in the course of that, I spoke to a range of interesting people, one of whom was Professor Frank Faraday, who had a rather bleak view of the future of intimacy that, in fact, we were more and more afraid of getting close to other people. We were more and more reluctant to take the risk of getting close to other people. And, and interestingly enough, early this afternoon, I did in conversation with him about his new book on fear, and he, in fact, reprised some of the same ideas, that, that we are afraid of uh, intimacy. We're afraid of opening up to each other. We're afraid of doing something wrong, and we're afraid of the pain of of rejection and uh, and he painted in the radio program a rather bleak picture of of a future where we we lose the ability to take those risks and to be intimate with each other and uh, and that relationships become very diluted into into kind of safe contained variants uh, and then in the rest of the program I basically the, 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 a lot of it consists of me going God, that sounds awful, as people tell me in increasingly graphic detail about the technology that is going to make it possible to find sexual satisfaction, either with uh, somebody who's not present in the room with you, or, or indeed is, uh, is maybe somebody thousands of miles away and you're interacting through the internet through technology, uh, or, or maybe, you'd maybe just with a machine and there's no person involved at all and uh and i realized that perhaps i am after all an unreconstructed romantic because i generally like to think that i'm fairly anything goes and fairly like you know whatever you want to do that's fine but i just spent this program getting more and more horrified at the thought of uh the end of intimacy really and and, and in particular the idea that sex is something as somebody described to me uh, it was it was somebody called Trudy Barber, uh, who I don't know. You may well quote in your book. I mean, absolutely, absolutely lovely woman, but very cheerfully told me that just as sex and reproduction are now really quite separate most of the time, uh, then sex and intimacy would be separate, and that you could just have completely non-intimate sexual satisfaction, possibly with a stranger on the internet, uh, and that that would be fine. And I, I realised I didn't feel fine about it at all. Um, so it, that was when I first actually just started to have opinions at, about sex robots. And then when I knew, because I, I know Kate, I knew she was writing this book, and she was complaining the difficulty of basically of getting on panels with sensible people to discuss sex robots. And I said something rashly like, well, look, if you ever want to get anybody on who, who thinks they're a bad idea, you know, I will happily... So then I couldn't say no. Anyway, here I am. So, so that's, that's where I come from. But, but it did force me to think, well, you know, why then? Why, why do I feel particularly uncomfortable about this? Is it just that I'm, you know, old and prudish and traditionalist? But I, I don't think so, actually. And you're, you're within close danger of me actually quoting John Paul Sartre at you. But luckily for you, I couldn't quite find the exact quote. So uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase. Uh, it's something that I, I read a while ago where he described the initial interaction of basically flirting. Basically, John Paul Sartre describes flirting. He describes a situation where you're in a room and, uh, and you catch somebody's eye across the room and you realise that they're looking at you uh, with a particular kind of interest and you become aware of that, that they have feelings of desire towards you and then you have feelings in response to that and they see that you are aware of them and what they're feeling and then you become aware that they're aware of what you're feeling. And there's this whole, before maybe, before you've even met or spoken or interacted, just by looking and awareness of the other person's look, there is a whole flirtation, a whole conversation of desire going on. And, and I realised that that is what 
for me would be missing if, with a sex robot because you might have something that physically resembled uh, the kind of human being that you'd been attracted to, but there would be nothing going on in the mind of the robot because it's a robot and doesn't have a mind. So there would be no process of the robot desiring you and being attracted to you and you being aware of that and then the robot being aware that you're aware of it and and that exchange of possibilities that exchange of 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 the the unknown of of what's quite risky i mean that is that's the kind of exciting risky part of an encounter where you don't know whether anything's going to happen or what's going to happen or what actually is the other person thinking or feeling uh but you're guessing at it and it's a whole process of uh of the unknown and sharing, exchanging the unknown and exploring and, and risking becoming closer to another human being. And that, for me, is the side that, that you would not reproduce with a machine. You know, I don't, this doesn't mean that I think sex robots should be banned or anything like that. You know, I have absolutely nothing against people buying dildos, butt plugs, whatever, you know, whatever aids they need to masturbation, uh, or even, I don't know, I mean, maybe, maybe people will have threesomes with sex robots, and, and what you've basically got is, let's not complicate our relationship by having another human being involved, let's get a sex robot. I've got nothing against all these things. Uh, I think masturbation is fine, high-tech masturbation is also fine, but let's not kid ourselves that high-tech masturbation, even with a humanoid machine, is a, is a human relationship. And, and I, so I suppose in summary, I'm not against sex robots because they're dangerous. I'm against them because they're not dangerous enough, because they take away the danger which is part of human intimacy and which should be part of human intimacy, and that it gives a safe alternative where we can run away from the messy, risky, unpredictable business of getting intimate with other human beings. Oh, very good. Thank you, Timandra. Very good point. So, are, are, are sex robots uh, dangerous enough? Uh, Simon, what do you think? <laughs> OK. Well, I think Timandra certainly um, ex uh, explained very eloquently why, why she's not in the market for one. But I don't think that uh, that convinces me that there isn't a market for them and that it might not be surprisingly and alarmingly huge. I am I'm, I'm going to try and persuade you that um, the artificial intelligence singularity is just around the corner, at least I was, until I went back to get my laptop with the speech I prepared on it and found it had failed to save it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> whether or not that is part of big tech trying to... Uh, <laughs> steer me away from uh, sounding that particular alarm, I don't know. <laughs> I, I feel, like Tamandra, I feel a certain ambivalence. I'm not particularly interested in the morality of it in terms of the robot, although that is, I think, a, a conversation which is taking place where the consciousness is an emergent property which eventually arises from any sufficiently intelligent system, whether artificial or organic, and whether then that robot uh, has the right to uh, refuse to be treated as a sex slave. That was... Um, uh, proposition which I think was explored in the television program Humans um, and in various other sort of cyberpunk novels and so on and uh, Ex Machina and so on and these are interesting ideas but it, there's an awful lot to try and get through. My main concern is that I suspect as a society we will be insufficiently uh, equipped to take it seriously, to notice the erosive, corrosive effect that things like sex robots, they're not a completely isolated example of what's going on in life at the moment, will have on us as a society, whether it's right or wrong, morally or pragmatically, is perhaps for others to decide, but I think we should take them seriously. Because they're silly, because they're naughty, because they sit alongside some plainly um, inadequate middle-aged man on this morning confronting Philip Schofield and Holly Wallaby or whatever her name is and um, <laughs> and everyone goes oh my god look at this loser he's got a sex robot um, you know his marriage must be a farce it's very easy to not treat these things seriously but 
you know, technology is moving at an absurd pace at the moment. It's only 10 years since the first iPhone was introduced. I very well remember seeing another comedian in a writing room had brought one in, and we looked at it much as if we might a speak and spell or something. We just thought it was some kind of funny little toy he'd brought along to amuse himself with. Nowadays, if you see somebody who's capable of moving along the pavement without glancing at their phone every 10 seconds, you suspect them of witchcraft. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, we're all utterly addicted to this kind of level of technology, and pornography has always been one of the great driving forces of all technological and, um, uh, you know, different media. We all know that the internet, of course, uh, was largely driven by pornography, the World Wide Web, um, hugely affected by the uh, development of VHS and DVD and all these kind of formats. Everything back to the Gutenberg Press. God knows how many weeks it was after the Gutenberg Press first rolled into action that the first bundle of pornography was found under a hedge, you know, in <laughs> suburban <laughs> Gutenberg, but it won't have been very long. And I think we could be going down the same route. And people don't, don't take it seriously because they think it's absurd. Because I think robots, sex robots, are still, for the time being, in that territory which is known as the uncanny valley, which is a very interesting uh, phenomenon whereby, as uh, representations of humans become ever more realistic, they become ever more alarmingly, uh, we become ever more alerted to their artificial nature. If you just have a drawing of Bart Simpson on, a, on the cartoon Simpsons, you accept him as a, as, a, as a boy. You accept him as a cartoon boy and it doesn't trouble you. But when you have movies like The Polar Express, if any of you remember that, and Tom Hanks is rendered in some strange hybrid of live action and cartoon, everyone feels distinctly unsettled and it doesn't feel at all like a cheerful story of a boy going to meet Father Christmas. It feels like something very much more unnerving is going on. Sex robots are, for the time being, in that uncanny valley. It's very hard for us to take them seriously as a proposition, as a realistic, alternative, sexual, intimate partner. But they will probably overcome that at some point, certainly to the degree that a couple of lagers and maybe a spliff and you'll be able to see past the gaps, you know. <laughs> and that is often what it takes anyway for people to achieve intimacy, as we know. So I think we need to take it much more seriously. Humanity's history, social history, has been, broadly speaking, the story of man, in particular man, and I'm using that with a small and capital M, man, trying to enjoy pleasures without taking responsibility for the necessary consequences of those pleasures. <laughs> he has had thousands of years of being able to get away with that on the sexual front. About 70 years ago, I suppose, something like that, in the 1960s uh, particularly, uh, feminism began to catch up with that. The pill made it possible for women to also have sex without facing the consequences. Feminism then established that as a sort of modus operandi for a whole political matrix through which to see the world and they should establish economic security and workplace equality and so on so that they can continue to not have to rely on men and not have to, let's say for the sake of argument, trap men into marriage through getting pregnant. And it has, of course, been a wonderful thing overall, but the reality is, you know, these are corrosive forces on the traditional family unit. We are already in this country, um, and across much of the Western world now, at below replacement level fertility. And this is largely due to partly technological, partly sort of philosophical, political, psychological developments in mankind. But the truth is, once you can have sex without facing consequences, People are not usually in a hurry to actually have children. That is the reality of it. And sex robots could very easily become part of that package. You add in no-fault divorce, you add in the expense of divorce, you add in the, the catastrophic consequences for a man if he does manage to get himself into a bad marriage and then find it breaking up. You know, this is a big part of the men's rights activist movement in America, and they are an extreme, you know, they, they trend into territory that I certainly wouldn't want to follow them into, you know, the red pills, men going their own way, all of that kind of stuff. But this is the kind of territory in which sex robots will, you know, begin to be a viable option. And from there, they will gradually seep in to more and more mainstream life. And I think we have to take it very seriously. The world's great religions have always been dedicated to maintaining the sort of social pressure on people to raise families and have children in order to enjoy sexual congress. And they have pretty much left the stage now and nothing else is coming to replace them. And I think ever more options which, uh, which enable people to enjoy sex without facing the consequences are only likely to be ever more popular. That'll do for me for now. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, Simon. So, Kate, are we insufficiently equipped? To take them on. I want to start by managing expectations um, <laughs> because there have been 
countless headlines over the past few years about, about sex robots and what they're going to do to society. And this includes anything from men won't be able to tell the difference, which I think is quite unfair to the men, um, to uh, sex robots will fuck us all to death, was one of my favourites. But <laughs> today, uh, there has been, or two days ago, there was one in The Sun that says, naughty not, sex robots will colonise Mars, says Lovebot tester who spent $200,000 on droids. Um, that's not going to happen, so I'd just like to reassure you of that. So um, what we actually have today, there, are, there has been a race to bring out the first commercially available sex robot. Um, and when I started researching this about four years ago, I was getting laughed at by other academics quite often. Um, even though I'm not the first by any means to, to look at this area, there have been people before me um, doing great work in the area. But um, it's, it, then it sort of it gained traction and people were getting concerned. And then there was a lot more exploration as ethics of AI in general became a, a topic of interest and, and it's a, a, still today very, very relevant. And then there was an announcement that companies were working on the first sex robot. And the one that's kind of won the race is a company called Abyss Creations in California who make uh, the real doll sex doll. And they've been making these sex dolls, high-end, silicon posable dolls for about 14 years now but they've made one that has an animatronic head the body is still just a sex doll body it doesn't move it can't stand up on its own um, and they've given her an ai personality that can also stand alone so you can have it in in your phone or tablet as an app so it's quite interesting uh, it's not fooling anyone we're, we're nowhere near westworld standards and this is a very very small scale thing there's a handful of workshops around the world creating these and it comes from the lineage of the sex doll there's a sex doll community worldwide. It tends to be very um, low key. Um, and it's not just the, the sort of lonely man in his basement with his, with his um, plastic lover type of thing. The, there are a wide variety of people who buy these dolls. And the main groups are fetishists or, or else people who want companionship. Um, also people who buy them just to pose them and, and photograph them. Um, and people who buy them for threesomes. There are people who buy, buy sex dolls for threesomes to, to sort of spice up their love life as well. So um, the history of the, the sex doll goes, goes way back. Um, the, the idea of creating a perfect artificial lover goes right back to stories. We, we all know the story of Pygmalion, for example, a Roman tale by Ovid, where Pygmalion was a sculptor who thought the women around him weren't perfect enough, so he created his own sculpture and prayed for it to be brought to life, with, and it was, she was brought to life with a kiss. There's older stories about a woman uh, whose husband died in battle, and she built a bronze replica of him and took it to bed with her. So actually, some of the earliest stories are about creating these male versions of these. But today, you can have a female, generally blonde and white, very hypersexualized, pornified doll with a little bit of animatronics, and that's the limit of it. And I find that so it's, it's quite objectifying of women um, and objectionable for that reason. Um, and I also, it's pretty rubbish because we are really, really bad at making human-like robots, really bad, not just because, as Simon said, the uncanny valley, um, but just the technology, it's expensive, it's difficult. The closest we're getting to sort of humanoid ones is Boston Dynamics. And can you imagine if Boston Dynamics made a sex robot? It's absolutely terrifying to imagine that. So that's what's out there. Um, but we have this parallel strand of sex toys. And sex toys have been around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, but they exist they existed initially as genital replicas. Um, and they've got abstracted over the years. And now we've got these beautiful sex toys that you could put on your mantelpiece and you might not be able to tell it's a sex toy. And I do this because I've got lots in my office. Um, people don't <laughs> realize on first glance what they actually are. Um, and so we, we're OK. We're comfortable with sex toys and we're comfortable with them not looking human. So is there something intrinsic in the form of the, the sex robot as it is now that, that is problematic for us? Now, I don't have anything against sex robots per se, except for this hypersexualized, pornified female form, which I think is just uh, rubbish and, and not good in perpetuating the kind of body image that women face all the time. But in terms of the morality of it, I did a lot of work looking at if someone is treating these robots um, badly, does that mean it'll spill over into real life? And we've heard the same argument with computer video games and we don't have evidence for that. We hear the same org argument with, with online porn. There's been 40,000 studies plus of the effect of porn in society, and no one can agree whether or not it's actually a bad thing. We can point to anecdotal evidence. We can point to different things that are problematic. 
there's no overall conclusive um, evidence. So I'd say that sex robots are, are very niche. Um, I think they'll probably stay niche. But what's interesting is when we start moving away from that form of the hypersexualized woman and going to more interesting things like immersive experiences or wearable technology for sex, and not just for sex, but for intimacy. And as Tamandra said, we already have smart sex toys. Um, you can connect them online and you can be having sex with someone in another part of the world. And that's become quite important in sex work for webcam models, for example. Um, so what if we extended it where we had um, wearable technology that could hug you or could stroke you or a duvet that you climbed inside and it, and it wrapped itself around you? You could have all kinds of sensual experiences. And with the AI, you don't have to have a human form. It's enough to get the impression of human connectedness from an AI, from the conversational interface, that we don't really need the body. So I'm a tech optimist, and I think we hear a lot of talk about how tech, like our smartphones, uh, we're becoming addicted, it's too much time, you know, I, I know I'm guilty, I walk around with it all the time. But um, it connects us all, it's brought us closer together than ever before, and so we do have this fear, we're, we're really conditioned as humans to have a dystopian fear of change and of technology and as it advances. But by and large, it's, it's led to massive progress. And I think there are people out there who want to have sex and are not able to for a number of reasons, be they psychological or physiological or just lack of opportunity. And if we can give people either intimate experiences or if we can use those, that technology to mediate and improve relationships between people and enhance our own relationships, then I don't think it's problematic. So I'm pro the sex technology. I just think it needs to be in a different form. Good, thank you very much. Yes. Thank you very much. So, sex yeah. technology brings us together? Uh, well, I wouldn't know, but uh, I was just about to say that it was exactly a year ago, or slightly less, at the Battle of Ideas, that you approached me with a gleam in your eye saying, I want to talk about sex robots at the Battle of Ideas next year. And I thought, well, what's this about? And um, having tried to think about it, I think I end up with the, the moral intuition that I think all of, or most of the other panelists have had, which is that um, the central moral question seems to be, what is the difference between a legitimate and an illegitimate sexual interaction? Now, some people say, well, it's just statistical. I mean, some people like this sort of thing, other people like that kind of thing. There's no normative element in it at all. And I'm not convinced by that. I think that um, normative questions are important, but I, uh, and they're bound to be bound up with, um, with uh, questions of human nature and uh, human desire, but I'm not quite sure how, so I remain rather agnostic on the actual ethics of sex robots. But let's start off with, I mean, having got the obvious jokes uh, aside, you know, like not working, able to work out a position about sex robots and, and, and the possibility that, uh, you know, you, you, you can't afford a sex robot, so you have to make do with a real person and all these, sort of things, <laughs> all these things we might imagine being said in this techno future that Kate has so um, enticingly described uh, for your delectation. But um, let's, let's take AI seriously and let's take the, the, the claims that were made, not so much nowadays, but in the earlier days of AI, uh, seriously about how computers might one day not just simulate but actually come to embody intelligence. Well, suppose that's true. Just suppose that um, one day these sex robots will uh, acquire minds because the, uh, all, all that's necessary to acquire a mind has been physically uh, given it. So just as in the case of human beings, it's plausible to say that the reason why we have minds, we have consciousness and thoughts and desires, is that there's something about our brains that makes it possible for us to have those, that mental life. Nobody actually knows what it is about the brain. Uh, a few philosophers are still dualists. They think that, uh, uh, that you know, we are interactions of non spiritual substances and material substances, but that's a fairly uncommon view. Let's take it, there's something about human biology, and especially human brains, that makes us conscious. Now, if that's the case, there's no reason in principle, although it might be a very remote technological um, possibility, might take thousands of years, but no reason in principle why there might be an artificial person, an artificial mind. Uh, whatever it is about brains that makes us conscious might be given to robots. Well, if that's the case, and let's suppose in this sci-fi world this is realized, then the way this question about sex robots just becomes the question we already have about human beings. How should we interact with human beings? The fact that these are artificial persons makes them no less persons. They're just artificially created. So they don't create any new questions. These, these robots will be persons, and presumably they'd have rights and responsibilities just as we do. Now, what's interesting about the, the, the sex robots being discussed is that, on the one hand, would-be consumers want them to be terribly realistic in certain ways. They want to have perfect bodies. 
They want to have a perfect genitalia, perhaps. They want to, to, to say the perfect things. But in another way, they're not meant to be realistic. They're not really meant to have minds at all. Because if they had minds, and if they were persons, they had real desires and thoughts about us as individuals, then the moral questions that, arise, that already do arise about persons, and the point about using robots is to escape those moral questions, is to have sexual objects, if you like, for whom no important ethical questions arise about how we interact with them. Um, rather like, uh, perhaps in some ways, like the sex toys already, already available, but in a more lurid way. I mean, I think Kate mentioned, or Tamanja mentioned, sex toys. And it's quite extraordinary looking at the, uh, some website uh, gave information about the sales of vibrators. It's a truly astonishing number of these things are sold, so they obviously serve a purpose. Either more women own these devices and are currently prepared to admit, or there's a relatively small number of women who own a phenomenally large number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like, like Kate, we just don't know, and it's probably best not to ask. But clearly some need is being catered for. Now, when it comes to robots, they are meant to stimulate personhood, meant to stimulate personality. This is where the, we, we, we run, it's unclear to me what sort of territory we're, uh, we're, we're sort of um, um, testing here. On the one hand, we've got the, the thought that the robot's meant to be very realistic. It's meant to have the perfect body, or say the perfect things, or whatever. And yet it's not meant to be realistic, because it's not really meant to be a person. Otherwise, we, you know, if heaven's sake, we have to have it right, so we'd have to, the responsibilities. We might get rejected by the robot. The right one might leave us for another robot. The right the robot might prefer robots to us. Why not? I mean, if it was like that. So we, we, we wouldn't want that. Which raises the question of... Um, what is it that we're looking for in a robot that we're not looking for in people? Why would somebody prefer a robot to a real relationship with a person? Now, in some cases, as I think uh, Kate said, it's because it's, they're substituting um, persons uh, with robots. Maybe they can't get a partner. Maybe nobody finds them attractive. Maybe they have some severe disability of one kind or another. For various reasons, people can't get partners. So maybe they're using robots as a substitute. OK, in that case, what they really want is a partner. So, as it were, if they're sexually interacting with the, with the robot, they're having certain thoughts. They're thinking, they're imagining this robot is their perfect partner. Or indeed, you know, in more ordinarily, people who are in a relationship separated by thousands of miles temporarily, they might use robots and imagine they're having sex with their actual partner. So the intentionality, as we say, the, the, the directedness of the thought is towards the partner. The robot is merely an intermediary. That's an understandable case. It's like phone sex with your partner or masturbation guided by your partner or whatever, I mean, when it, who's not there. All these things, the intentionality, the thoughts are not disrupted. Where it becomes more interesting, I think, is when you don't want a relationship with a person at all. You actually want the robot. Now the question is, what are you wanting? Here we have a sort of strange bifurcation, if that's the word, of motives. On the one hand, you want this robot never to reject you, so the robots are meant to be able to say, I, you know, you, oh, wow, that turns me on, or do that again, or you know, never don't do that, but you know, do that again, or are you too tired now? Don't worry, I'll leave you alone now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just thinking aloud here. I don't know. No idea what these things might really be in reality. Um, but the thought is, okay, I want it up to a point to be a person, but I know it's not really a person. That's the thrill. It's not really a person at all. Now, when is that legitimate? Certainly there are, there's a difference in relationships general between relationships of use and relationships of non-use. So relationships of use, I'd love a robot to clean my flat. Who <laughs> wouldn't? Uh, make my bed. Actually, I don't make the bed, but, maybe, but could, could be bothered to make the bed. You know, tidy up. These robots are terribly useful for those kind of things. They're coming in already. Robot doctors, robot, you know, um, you, you know we've got about driverless cars are a kind of uh, robot. These things are coming in. If the, if the relationship is already one of use, then all right, it just makes life easier. But when it comes to friends and lovers and so on, we don't tend to think in that way. I mean, it's not just in sex that these problems arise. I mean, suppose, you, you, suppose you're lonely. You have the friend robot, the, the robot you can crack jokes with, and, and the robot laughs at your jokes and has a sort of ability to interact. Well, that's not sexual, but it's still artificial. Suppose you are very romantic. You don't want sex as such. You do a bit, but that's not the main thing. You just want somebody to say, I love you. You, know, you want somebody to say to whom you can say that you love them and, to, and they love you back. The robot might do that. Okay, so it's a substitute. Um, you want the ro you're imagining perhaps that, that, that something really did, somebody really did love you, but if you wanted the robot just to say you, to that to you without imagining that somebody loved you, we've got a serious difficult question about what the motivation for it would be, because uh, when we say you know, have tender relationships, when we are generously loving towards somebody, we don't think of the objects of those love as being in relationships of use. 
This comes back to the final point, which is, really, do we want to live in a make-believe world? Now, make-believe is a very tricky idea, because the make-believe, some people think religions make-believe. I don't know whether it's true. It might be true of some religious thoughts. It's, you, you work up the feelings in yourself as if you believe this. But, you know, outside the ceremony, you don't really believe it. You don't really believe some, that, you know, the body of that the wafers turned into the body of Christ, or at least some believers might think in this way, but you, you work up this feeling that the port's appropriate to it. So it's a hybrid state, make-believe. Now, um, Robert Nozick, the American philosopher, had a fantastic thought experiment that's in the 70s, which makes this point clear. He imagined that, in fact, all of reality is make-believe. I'm just a brain in a vat. It's being stimulated by electrodes fed by some mad neuroscientist. I think I'm talking to a bunch of interested uh, Londoners who want to know about ideas at the Barbican. But in fact, it's just a dream or a delusion. I'm going to wake up. It's going to turn out to be a nightmare. All right. Would we want that? No, because we want our interactions to be real. This is the problem that sex robots uh, give us. Should we and do we want our interactions to be real? And robots, of course, as you say, threaten to me because it seems that they, they would not be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gosh. So a lot on the table, and um, I, I would love uh, to hear what you have to say, which question and comments. I'm a postgrad at Lancaster University and I'm writing a project looking at the digitization of pastoral care and I'm really interested in how um, digital technology is manipulating the way that we do dialogue with one another and issues of personhood and reality and I wonder where you see sex robots in that debate um, especially things like um, you were talking about um, personhood and sex robots and where does the real begin and the unreal end I guess um, but also, um, I'm interested in how technology kind of jumps over minorities. So, um, as a trans person, I'm really intrigued by how uh, sex tech can allow trans people to engage in intimacy in a way they can't at the moment, all the time. Mm. But also how sex tech can kind of jump over trans people or disabled people or um, people who don't engage in sex and kind of leave them behind in this kind of weird, unrealized space and giving robots far more recognition or um, kind of accepted notions of, of sex and reality. Mm. Thank you very so much. much. Um, I went to a robotics exhibition that um, actually wasn't about sex bots, but about sort of care for the elderly and childcare. And that, that's quite an interesting sort of liminal space where obviously intimacy is a, a big issue. And I, I'm slightly horrified by the idea that you know, a carer, perhaps we don't have enough of them, it's you know, an under-resourced area. So it makes a lot of sense to have uh, sort of robotic step-ins for that role, but that we intuitively feel that would hugely underserve the person that was being cared for, that they wouldn't be having a realistic experience. And that while it's better, say, than someone sort of abusing someone in care or them having nobody to turn to, that we wouldn't want it to be normalised either, but just sort of an option to cater where there is no alternative. Thank you very much. Jan? I hesitate to bring in animals at this stage <laughs> so early on, <laughs> oh, but no, no. that's what's in my mind. We don't find it disturbing that people have pets and that they love uh, and seek intimacy mm. with, uh, with certain boundaries, yes. which I, want, I wouldn't mind people asking, what's the difference between bestiality and this? Is there an argument for... De uh, decriminalising bestiality. Sorry to throw that out. <laughs> don't feel obliged to pick it up. But um, I, but isn't the point about having pets and why we don't find that disturbing is that we see it as reciprocal to, in some way. You know, on the one hand, we know we're humanising a, a creature which you could say is an object. But on the other hand, that creature really does have needs because it's alive. And so is there, therefore, any um, evidence that people want sex robots that do actually have needs? And the, you know, like a Tamagotchi, for example, but the sexual version of that. Can I take the last question and then call uh, the panel back? Thank you. A uh, question for Piers. Um, Nozick's brain in the vat argument is similar to the hedonistic pleasure machine mm. argument. And we're talking about this distinction between yeah. authenticity and pleasure. Mm. Um, I'm always surprised in philosophy seminars how many people in uh, ethics discussions say they would opt for the pleasure, the pleasure machine and, and, and take a hedonistic line of argument. Um, so do you think that authenticity is very important in this debate, or is pleasure going to win out? Sorry, can somebody tell me what the pleasure machine is? Oh, you, you can choose, would you rather live an authentic mm. life and, and have a real life, or would you choose to sip into a, a matrix of pleasure, where nothing is real, but everything's great? Yeah, mm, that's right. Very good question. Please um, 
the panel on whatever um you know yes please okay uh, um they're all really good questions um the first one on, on what's um the real intact it's coming to the bit on diversity and equality there's been work because uh, these sex robots as they exist are very much a reductive stereotypical female body and there have been people looking into why that is and um a very good post or a very good doctoral researcher um krizia pooch has been looking at sex robots from a queer Latina transpect, uh, perspective, um, where she's, they've got said, this is not representative of me, it doesn't represent anybody in the groups that I am living in, why is that? But at the same time, recognising that it is another form of performing gender in the, in the form of the technology. And she, they like me, she also says that it should probably be something that we try and fight against and move away from. But coming back to the sex technology, I ran two sex tech hackathons at Goldsmiths in 2016 and 2017. And we looked at new forms of creating um, technology for intimacy that wasn't necessarily focused on sex and wasn't in a human body form or a human body part form necessarily. And it was fascinating just looking at the ways that you could transcend a lot of this stuff. So we're moving away from expectations around gender, expectations around form. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating. And, and people were coming up with just such incredibly... Um, interesting technology that would fit all types of bodies um, that could be used in many different ways. So yeah, there's definitely scope for that and I'm very optimistic about that being something that will move forward um, as people get more accepted of it. Um, the second one about care for elderly and childcare, um, there, there's a, <laughs> um, I, I do address this in my book about sexuality and care for elderly people um, because we see a lot of um, times when elderly people are put into care homes and are infantilized and care workers are not happy to talk about sexuality and it's seen as very taboo especially if they are coming from if the elderly people are coming from a subculture or have a, a sexual orientation that hasn't been recognized in their lives and people don't want to talk about it and so i think there is space there for technology of uh, intimate technology to be available but we're all very very shy about talking about it because it's so taboo but in terms of care in general um when you've got elderly people who have some form of dementia then we have to be very very careful because you don't want to lead the deception this idea of the intentionality you don't want that deception to be at a stage where it is actually genuinely confusing to someone so that's problematic but i'm i'm sort of in favor of um robotics and technology being used in care in an assistive manner but not in a replacement manner in the same way with the sex robots i see it as something that can exist alongside our relationships rather than replace them okay. Sorry. Can I stop you yeah. there and ask uh, if someone else has yeah sure I, I i was very interested you mentioned the um elderly people uh, there was an article um that was reprinted i think from uh, quartz.com then it was reprinted in the back of the week this week about uh, a robotic baby seal that is now used to uh, reassure and calm patients who are in uh, various stages of dementia and so on um, they find it enormously reassuring they love to pet it it, it, it uh, they're told when they're given it that um, it's a robot seal not a really one uh, but uh, not a real one but whether or not they hold on to that information in any meaningful way of course is is moot but um, it does kind of throw some light on this, you know, the extent to when obviously uh, dementia is a um, fundamentally different state to that which most of us like to think we're in when we're engaging in sexual activity. But there is a, a degree to which, you know, you can lose track of reality, you can lose track of exactly what is real, what is not, what is a, a mediated, what is an ersatz simulacra and what is an authentic experience and that, that can be heightened certainly by the confusions that go with uh, Alzheimer's and so on but it doesn't seem to me entirely different. Um, there was also a case where a, a, an elderly woman not, not completely sort of lost to dementia. Um, the one thing that she apparently always brightened up for was the arrival of her two-year-old granddaughter um, but they did an experiment, rather a cruel experiment arguably but uh, there we are, progress and so on. Um, they did an experiment where they replaced, they, they offered her, instead of her granddaughter, a, um, a robot baby. And that responded to her so much more reliably and, and rewardingly. It would coo and it would smile and it would giggle when she fed it and so on. Whereas her two-year-old granddaughter, like a lot of two-year-olds, uh, didn't always play ball, sometimes whinged and moaned and said she was hungry and kept fidgeting. And the old woman lavished her attention on the robot and completely ignored the child after about 10 minutes. And... Um, <laughs> You know, this is what I foresee happening with the sex robots because, you know, <laughs> sexual relations are awkward, equally uh, uh, 
complicated and compromised by uh, the um, occasional sort of ar argumentative nature of the uh, would-be loved one. The only other thing I wanted to mention, I don't have an answer to this, but I do think it's interesting why society is so utterly against sex with pets, for instance. There was a woman, this came up on Twitter about a year ago, there was a woman who was arrested and she was in the newspapers. She was seen being led into court. She was a middle-aged woman. She looked a little bit down on her uppers, but not, you know, completely uh, outside, of, uh, outside of the range, as they say. And, um, and she had had, a, she had a, a pet Alsatian, which it was discovered she had been, um, I think she'd been encouraging it to perform cunnilingus on her, and, um, and she enjoyed that. And I think that's as far as it went. I don't know. But um, it was sort of, you know, there were probably journals. You could read the full details, but that was as much as they went into in the Telegraph. But uh, <laughs> I did, I mean, she was exposed to, um, to uh, you know, ridicule on, on social media. And I felt very sorry for her. I was thinking, you know, that's, there are a lot worse things that people do on a daily basis to Alsatians than that. It's causing her, if you're saying it's like, oh, it's not, you know, it's not uh, whatever the word you use was, that basically the dog is not on board with this. Well, to be honest, every time I take my dog for a walk, I have to yank it powerfully by the neck to pull it away from every third bloody lamppost, you know. It's, so if that's not, you know, if I have to ask the dog's permission before I do anything, I'll get nowhere, you know. <laughs> I, it is, I think, to be honest, the reason we post-rationalise it by saying that we're not comfortable with the dog um, you know, being involved in a sexual act it can't meaningfully give permission for, the truth is we don't like bestiality because we feel it debases the race in the same way that we feel you know, that, uh, that man is made in the, in, the, in the image of God, even though we've obviously rejected that idea on a rational level. At some level, we like to think we're a little bit above that, and it debases the dignity of humanity for all of us if any one person would choose to engage in carnal knowledge of a dog. But... You know, instead we, we post-rationalise it with, with the dog's wishes. <laughs> Could I just uh, come back to the point made about the um, experience machine, machine and pleasure versus authenticity by the, the man at the middle there? Yes, it's, it's, it's an important point. I mean, the, the point of the thought experiment is to ask us to say, well, would it bother us if it turned out that uh, all the things we take pleasure in were somehow fake and these, I mean, our friends didn't really like us, uh, we weren't really successful in the way we thought we were. It's all a kind of illusion produced by neuroscientists. And the intuitive answer the students meant to come up with was, of course we care, because if, I, if I'm in a state of pleasure because I've heard good news, it's because of the good news that I take pleasure. The, the, the news is not valuable because it produces pleasure. I take pleasure because the news is good. It's that way round. Now, when it comes to um, sexual interactions, the, I suppose the parallel thought would be something like this. Uh, I take pleasure in this person whom I suppose to be a person who responds to me precisely because I believe that this is a real interaction. This is a real interaction with a human individual who typically perhaps has thoughts about me. This is a bit like the Sartre case that was mentioned, you, you, where you mutually recognise each other in a mirror. This the, 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 it was made much more by Thomas Nagel in, in future articles about that. You know, I make high contact, then I notice she's noticed me, then I notice she's noticing me noticing her, and you, you have a mutually reinforcing levels of, of, of interpersonal intentionality. That's meant to be the norm of sexuality. Of course, whether it should be is another question. Now, with the robot case, what, what does one want? Presumably, you're not so deluded that you don't know it is a robot. On the contrary, you bought it at great expense <laughs> because it's a robot, because it's not a person. So what's going on psychologically? What, what do you intend to get out of this interaction? Are you trying to engage in some make-believe that it's a person, but without actually quite believing it is? A bit like punching a cushion when you want to punch your enemy. You know, you, you imagine it's your enemy, but of course you know it isn't really, because you wouldn't do that to your enemy. Similarly, there might be certain sexual acts that you want to perform, certain kinks, let's say, that your partner won't. Uh, and, but you think, well, this robot at least doesn't have any feelings or any, any, any um, um, objections. All right, they could, could be doing that, but there's still a question I can't quite work out. I'm thinking aloud somewhat, as you may have noticed, <laughs> about um, the role of belief and make belief in this sort of interaction, because I think that's at the heart of it, and I think that's what be, might be the key to some of our moral questions, particularly when it comes to the yuck response that's been hinted at so much. You know, uh, Jonathan Hyde, in his recent book, um, asked a lot of American liberals, well, do you, is there any moral objection to um, you know, somebody in private and without anyone knowing having sex with a dead chicken? And of course, the, the yuck response is, of course, it's obviously very wicked, but you can't name a victim and you can't name somebody who looks on as being offended. So the typical liberal just can't say what's morally wrong with this. Yet everybody knows there is something wrong with it. It's pretty fundamental. And I'm sure that's many people's secret things about sex robots and pornography, which I just chaired a panel on. Well, OK, maybe there are no victims and so on, but we all know there's something wrong with this. And I, I don't know whether that's true or not, but we should take it seriously. We shouldn't just say it's irrational. <laughs> 
you mind? Yeah, well, I guess to pick up on that, I mean, <laughs> thanks for throwing in bestiality so early on. <laughs> but, but I think in a way it is a useful parallel because it, there's kind of different arguments around bestiality aside from the idea that it causes harm to the animal, which, you know, if we assume that it's an animal which is not caused harm and is to some extent enthusiastic about the, the process. It, it, I, I'm inclined to agree with Simon, really. I think it, it's we object to it not because it harms the animal, but because it degrades us. Why does it degrade us? Well, it, obviously, there is that element of, look, we should draw a line between humans and other animals, which is a visceral thing. But I, but I think there is also genuinely another thing that an animal is to some extent a thing i mean it's obviously it's, it's also sentient and can experience pain and pleasure but it, it, it cannot reciprocate mm. feelings towards us or attitudes towards us and therefore we are essentially having having sex with a thing when we have sex with an animal so for that reason you know in a way i i don't see i don't think it's immoral in the sense that it, it, we draw a moral line when we cause harm but is it immoral in the sense that we are not cultivating a better us when we uh, have sex with an animal? And, and I think it, it's the same kind of discomfort I have about having sex with objects, which is essentially what a, what a, a, a sex robot would be, that you, you have the part of you that does intimacy, if you like. And I don't just mean the physical part. If I, I don't, hardly mean the physical part at all. I mean, I think that side of it is... You know, really wank yourself to death. Obviously, knock yourself out. It's, I, I have no issue with that at all. It, it's the it, 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 it's the using time and emotional energy you could put into intimacy to relate to a thing or a, or, a, or a dog or whatever. Um, that that is the problem I have with it. Interestingly, one of the most upsetting things I've heard from the rest of the panel is the idea that you have a robot that would laugh at your jokes. <laughs> <laughs> and I just think that. <laughs> It, it, it is actually that, and the idea of care robots that would respond to human beings who need care. I mean, it, it, caring is the last thing a robot can do. A robot doesn't mm. give a shit. I mean, a robot is, it just has no feelings. It has no feelings of warmth. It doesn't, it has no, it has no moral accountability for the way it behaves towards you. It has no emotions towards you. Uh, and, and for all those reasons, I think letting a it's robot bad. take up those functions towards a human being in, in, who needs care is is as bad as as letting them take their place in an intimate relationship. I just wanted to come in there because it, in the article it made an interesting point when it was talking about the robots that were designed in order to look after the elderly, which is that in terms of from the elderly's point of view, from the patient's point of view, the robot is entirely capable of care and much more reliably so because for them, care is simply that you are centred in that robot's attentions. They're your your outcomes, your welfare is all that robot is programmed to care about. But it doesn't, well, it doesn't care. It, the the thing, patient it doesn't, care. doesn't yeah. care. No, you're using the word care differently. Obviously, it all comes down to linguistics in the end. But you're using the word care to describe a feeling that yeah. the robot is or is not capable of having, exactly. and you've decided it's not capable of having it. But the patient doesn't give a damn about mm -hmm. that. The mm -hmm. patient wants to feel looked after. And the robot will do that 24-7, whereas a lot of the sort of people who end up working in care homes, as Panorama proves on a virtually annual basis, don't. But, the, but you see, but this, I think, actually, this draws us right back to the very first question. I would, I'll be brief. We, by what are the effects on pastoral care of digitising things? I, I mean, I think, actually, this is part of a much vaster problem, which is that we do accept the illusion of being the centre of the universe through all the technology that is designed around us and is designed to give us whatever we want right at that instant, an instant small hits of satisfaction, and the sense that everything is provided just for us because we're so special. And even though we know that's not how it works and these are just machines and computer programs that are designed to keep us coming back, we, we go along with that. And, and I, think, I think that is a much bigger, wider problem and not just a problem of technology, but a problem of where we find ourselves in the world today. Okay, come back and many um, important questions. I think this um, issue of care, I think like a few of people have uh, said, the sex robot as tool, as you know, a, a ranking machine, I don't really have an issue with that. <laughs> but I think what um, a few of you have talked about is this kind of servicing versus the sort of emotional development. And I think the thing that you also talked about, Piers, mm. I just wonder um, 
whether there's a danger of that kind of care and expecting intimacy and uh, a sort of response from sex robots or care robots. I mean, there are robots in Japan that have been developed to uh, respond to autistic children and to be companions. And the companion robots in Japan are uh, sort of already in existence, I believe. But I just worry that the danger is that actually, you know, that authenticity about, doesn't it serve to make people even more alienated because they're conscious, you know, and um, I suppose actually emphasise that people, emphasise people's loneliness rather than actually alleviate it in some way. Thank you very much. Um, just to come back to Simon. Um, mm, okay, so I, I, you know, I, I hear you that robots are maybe technically capable of doing a better job than current carers are and that there are obviously evil humans who don't do their job and robots can be programmed to be, you know, to do a job efficiently. But isn't there a sort of, isn't the issue a kind of gaping hole where, in terms of morality where a kind of concept of deception and falsity and falsehood comes in and sort of taking people who can't distinguish between real and false or people who are demented or whatever, you know, giving them a, sim you know, a, a simulation of what's real is a lie and that may be okay, and you know, we maybe maybe it's not okay though. I mean, I just think that is actually a serious moral question. Um, and you seem to be sort of saying, oh well, you know, let's take a pragmatic look. But isn't there a kind of shouldn't we at least have a sort of serious pause over the, the morality of of, of yeah of, of presenting a falsehood essentially? Can I say um, just throw it to to the floor that uh, I don't know in terms of sex robots, I think uh, not caring robots, but sex robots. I think that. Uh, we would be pretty much, um, you know, conscious and uh, aware that it is uh, robots. Mm. So I think that, uh, I, you know, I want to throw it to the floor. I think that uh, um, I would, I would uh, uh, take the fun part of it and why not to experiment? And I, I wonder what you think, um, you know, just for fun to have uh, a sexual experience with a robot. Is, it, is that so degrading? Is that so immorally acceptable? That's, uh, no, that's not not to you fine. in particular. I, I want to floor. To be clear, I was talking about the care of elderly yeah, people with yeah. dementia, but I, I, you know, if people want to have fun yeah, with sexual fact, robots, Yeah, in fact, I said, let aside, yeah, let aside uh, the, the caring. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. Um, you might remember me as the wanker from the porn talk. Um, <laughs> we're told that women want emotion from sex, yet they're the overwhelming majority of consumers of sex toys, which is kind of counterintuitive to me at first. If so, why is it called a sex doll, unless this is catering to women's plasticity in relation to sexual orientation? Um, I'm disturbed by the idea that sex always has to be about love. Some of the most meaningful and enriching sexual experiences I've had in my entire life have been when love was decidedly off the table. Um, why would intimacy be missing? Uh, if it is a case of the uncanny valley being leapt out of, we're fairly gullible as men, and I presume we can get there with women convincing nature as well. Um, online counselling has proved very effective in terms of its effect, uh, you know, it, uh, as a solution to mental health problems. The Two, uh, fi one final question and one final thought. Um, will we get to immersive VR experiences before the hardware of um, a sex doll is up to standard? And finally, just a thought for everyone to lull over. In my opinion, it's the thoughts and desires of your other half that make sex tantalizing. You need to feel needed. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Uh, Kate suggested that the main moral objection uh, to sex dolls would be the objectification of women, which I would agree with, but that comes with a consequence, which is that dildos might be described as objectifying men, so that if you did legislate on that basis, you'd have to get rid of all that as well. Possibly the most bizarre philosophy uh, peer-reviewed paper I've ever read was written by Melinda Vardos, in, um, published in 2005, in the peer-reviewed Journal of Political Philosophy. It's entitled The Manufacture for Use of Pornography. And in it, uh, Vardas effectively argues that um, in pornography, that the woman in pornography is a real woman. 
because she should be treated as a real woman. She is consumed, in, in her words, um, a, a, as a real woman, and men are satisfied uh, a, a, as a real woman. So whereas, say, a, a photograph of an apple is not a real apple with pornography, because men get satisfied it from it, presumably through masturbation, the a woman in pornography is a real woman. So therefore, she wants to put women in pornography in exactly the same ontological category as uh, uh, so a woman on a piece of paper as the as real woman who exists in real life. But then she realizes that there's a potential problem, and it's what's uh, which is the one about vibrators for uh, that has already just previously been mentioned by the previous commentator that if um, pornography is real, uh, women in pornography is real women is are uh, vibrators for women utilised as real men? And she argues against that. And the reason why she argues against that is because she says, well, she looks back to what the original purpose of the vibrator was, and she said it was for medical reasons, for women to, 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 to for a medical need of having an orgasm for various different reasons. And therefore, because the original attempt was never for um, uh, pleasure, Therefore, that's not the same reason. So it's a bit weird, but if anyone's interested, <laughs> Melinda Vardos, 2005. Thank you very much. Philosophy. Thank you. Yeah, I want to read that. <laughs> and then, yeah. So it's just interesting. I, I'm uh, to Robin's intuition about porn and, and uh, why, because there's no victim, why, why, why should uh, there be any real um, objection to it, right? But to me, or the analogy I would have for, for porn and in the previous discussion, and it'll be interesting when the sex industry gets a hold of, of this technology and exploits it fully. Um, uh, to me, uh, porn is to sex as sugar is to food. The way the food industry has basically hacked the human desire for, um, for food, uh, the, the porn industry has hacked the, uh, the normal natural desire for sex to make, to make money and uh, exploit that. So, um, so in the first and second worlds, uh, we don't really have a problem with malnutrition or hunger now. We have a problem with obesity. And the, so I would use that analogy. Uh, porn has basically decreased. Our, there is some, uh, a lot of evidence that the correlation between the, the drop in violence and uh, of sexual violence, pornography has helped that. And, um, and the uh, high calor uh, calorific foods Sugar in the food has helped to reduce the level of hunger and malnutrition in the world, but there are problems. The problem is at the other side, the other extreme. So I think that um, the intuition that there is something wrong with it is actually deeper than, than just a... So, so in this discussion, the previous discussion, we basically um, skipped the moral question. Is it good or bad? We're not asking that. And I think actually there's a deeper question. Is this healthy for human beings? Okay. What is this, is Thank this you. It's really interesting that Tamandra pointed to Jean-Paul Sartre because uh, um, he, uh, he wrote a short story called Intimacy, uh, which I read years ago, decades ago, but it opens, I think, in, with the character in a brothel um, with the prostitutes. And, um, you know, the, the, we, prostitution, there's quite a lot of uh, uh, anger against uh, sex bots uh, in the sex industry at the moment. Um, it's been uh, um, in certain bordellos where there's been sex bot bordellos in Turin, apparently, and uh, in, in, in legal states in the USA where prostitution or bro brothels are allowed, uh, where there's been a kind of backlash from um, prostitutes uh, around uh, uh, the growth of the bot farms, or the sex bot farms, and, uh, and so forth. So, you know, we are kind of increasingly living in this automated world. You know, our everyday interactions in the world are being replaced by. Um, um, you know, uh, 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 in supermarkets, you know, by um, checkout counters that talk to you and thank you and wish you a good day. And one of them spoke, uh, you know, in sort of in the theme of Halloween to um, with a Boris Karloff voice, you know, um, uh, in my local Poundland, which, by the way, sells uh, vibrators for a pound. Um, and um, and there's little ones that look like a lipstick, which sells for a pound. Um, quite amazing. So, so you know, this, this kind of mainstreaming of, of sex aid, sex toys, now to, by extension, we are seeing um, the, the, the birth of the sort of se uh, sex bot bordello, which is starting to um, piss off a lot of sex workers. Uh, I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that, because okay. on one level, we could say that, you know, we use, uh, people use prostitutes to... 
uh, in a sense, you know, as an objectified um, uh, fantasy that you pay for, and this person, this woman, would fulfill all your kind of sexual desires, depending on how much you pay. Um, and um, but equally so, um, they are, you know, in the world of science fiction, there might be a sort of a rebellion going on there. Very good, thank you. Sex robots already exist. They're not that good yet, and I think that's why they're not more prevalent. But we will get there. We're probably 10, 15 years ago from the good ones, the really good ones. <laughs> you and have I to explain you, that uh, later. I bet you that 99% of them will be female sex robots. And uh, so, j j just for the men. And, oh, what was it? What was I going to say? Yeah, female sex robots. And funnily enough, they're not going to be mostly used for sex. Most of, most of them, they'll be used for companionship. And they will, are going to have the AI, the, AI, the AI for them to be able to do that. Because really, men don't want so much sex. They just want somebody to say some good things to them after they come back from work, yeah, without the nagging. <laughs> So, we are so terrible. Yeah. And, then we have the, and then we have the artificial wombs, and they're coming. We are 10, 15 years away from them. And, and those two, men will use them, millions of men will use them to replace the wife and the mother. But men don't want to do that. They're forced to do that. They're forced to do that by government regulations, by the, um, the, the divorce, the no-fault divorce, and uh, custody with the kids, and so on. And hopefully, I hope that um, this technology will force the people who vote, those politicians who vote for this, uh, who enact these laws, to change their mind and remove government away from relationships so we can go back to having natural relationships without somebody on top of us pulling the strings. So very I applaud, good observation. Thank I you. applaud the sex bots. Thank you very much. <laughs> so I invite the panel to come back to whatever uh, points and uh, question has been asked. May I, who wants? Uh, who may wants I talk dildos? <laughs> I want to talk about dildos if I manage. Okay. Um, and just because that, that, that was really good points. Um, the the first thing that the the, the very first um, wanker. Um, <laughs> it was his description. Yeah. Th so this idea that women want emotion from sex. Um, I did a lot of looking into this for the book, and what I could see was that variations in sex drive, it, it, it varies from person to person, not from, from male to female. There's not, it's just not, the, the, the evidence is not there. Um, but I think the, the sex doll is particularly a male phenomenon because that's the way it has been, because um, there is a lot more of women being socialized into being the emotional gatekeepers, and so we have this substitution of the sex doll. Um, the vibrator thing, uh, the dildo thing, a, a lot of the sex toys today have been abstracted away from male genitalia. And in fact, the most, one of the most popular um, sex toys worldwide looks like a microphone. It's the Hitachi Magic Wand. Um, it doesn't really look like a penis. Um, same with the, the um, rampant rabbit vibrator, which was put into that form because it was um, to, to get away from obscenity laws in Japan, and actually they basically just optimised the penis. Um, so in terms of the... <laughs> Your mileage may vary. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the vibrator thing, it's actually a myth that the vibrator was invented to give women orgasms to cure hysteria. Um, it, unfortunately, it, it's a lovely story, but um, there's no evidence of that either. But um, Hallie Lieberman's book, Buzz, is a really good account of this. And actually, it, it was invented as a medical device for, for things like muscle pain. Um, so, yeah, you know, try, try it out on your neck the next time you've got a stiff neck. Um, or whatever. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I think this idea that you have to have an emotional connection for sex really perplexes me because um, I see it as being, yes, that is a type of sex you can have, but this idea that it must be reciprocated. There are people falling in love with people all the time and it's not reciprocated, but we still feel those feelings. And so I think it's perfectly valid. Feel that Thank way. you very much. Yeah, no, I don't think you have to, sex always has to be about love, but it, I also think that intimacy doesn't always have to be about love and you can have moments of intimacy facilitated by sex, if you like. I, I think sex is, sex is just a great opportunity to get really close to another human being, even if it's quite briefly and, uh, and in a limited way. So I just think it's a pity to squander that, really. Um, but I think there was a really interesting point right, right at the back about servicing versus emotional development. And I, and I think, I mean, did to kind of loop back I, to the caring idea, the the taking care of people, the giving care of pe to people, the caring about people in an active way is not just for them. It's also for you. You also grow 
um, and develop and become a better human being when you actually subsume your own immediate pleasure to something outside of yourself, whether that's some great cause or whether it's the needs of your ageing relative who actually needs needs you to listen while they tell the same story again and again or need to take into the toilet or whatever. And, yeah, those things are degrading and tedious and not what you would choose to spend a fun Sunday afternoon. But the fact that you take that on because you care about that person is part of you becoming a, a fully formed adult and taking responsibility in the world. So that's why I think it's a shame to say, oh, let's outsource those things to... To robots and you know and the same with relationships yeah relationships are, are hard and messy and difficult and demanding and and this wonderful uncertainty with the other person a lot of it is really irritating and complicated and frustrating and often heartbreaking but you know that's what being a human being is about otherwise really really what's the point <laughs> okay we have three minutes <laughs> Yeah, Can I just say very quickly, um, I agree with this gentleman about the um, companionship element, and I think it is under, underestimated the degree to which robots will be able to provide that. Um, I, I studied uh, advertising. Study, I was employed in advertising sales when I first left university without any other clue of anything more constructive to do with my time. And um, we were taught a technique in order to just keep a conversation ticking over and win the sort of trust and... and and uh, sort of deepen the relationship with the client, which was if you couldn't think of anything useful or, or interesting to say to what they just said, just repeat the last three words of their sentence back to them. This is a technique apparently um, taught to girls who are employed in champagne dive bars in Soho, where a drunk businessman go in order to convince themselves that their money has bought them some kind of um, you know, female company that they're, they're entitled to, and they sit there and go, my wife doesn't understand. Doesn't understand you. No, she doesn't understand me. She's always on it, always on at you, yeah, and you just have to repeat the last three words. And this is enough to get fat businessmen, this is enough to get those fat businessmen, this is enough to get those fat businessmen to pay three or four hundred pounds for a flat bottle of fake champagne, you know, before they're turfed out. So social media, I mean, this was part of the reason I was interested in this topic is because I made a program about social media and part of it, obviously, its entire business model is gathering your data. We all know that. What will it be used for? Well, partly it could be used to be fed into, a, into a, 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 an artificially intelligent sex robot which would be able to then use all of that information and constantly learn from you. And machine learning technique is extraordinarily, all it does is just use endless feedback loops to try and hone itself. A machine, as you probably all know, beat the world number one Go player. Go, a phenomenally complex game, far more po positions on the ball possible than in chess. It beat him having learned the rules of the game that morning. It learned and then it reiterated through all the possible games that could work and how the different scenarios would play out. And by the end of that day, it was the number one player in the world. If it can do that, it can very easily learn to provide a bit of conversational company when you get home from work and you've had a shitty day and you just want to complain about the boss. You know, and it won't give you any earache about you haven't fixed that fucking gate yet. So <laughs> it's going to be... And I, I agree with Tamandri. Yes, of course, you know, what is life about if not putting up with the difficulties of relationships? But I'm talking about what will happen, not what should happen. Piers? <laughs> yeah, um, just a few related points. On the question of uh, right sex and love, um, I agree that, I mean, people's temperaments are different. I mean, some people say or possibly believe that they can't have satisfying sex without romantic love. Other people are quite different. I think there's just a range of individual differences on this question. But it cuts across the robot issue because when it comes to sex robots, I mean, most people who sexually desire people, desire to have sex with something they want, want that person to desire them. The robot, by X hypothesis, does not actually have any desires. So you're desiring something that doesn't desire you. Is that a moral problem? Well, I don't know. It may or may not be. I mean, it's, if there is a moral problem, I think it comes down to this uh, failure of uh, directedness of thought. But the other piece of what is you want to raise is about what the harm would be in general terms. I mean, people often say that something is a good social phenomenon because it has good effects. And so uh, with sex robots, well, it'll, it might keep potential rapists off the streets and so on. The flip side of that, of course, is that people have occasionally talked darkly about paedophile robots, you know, um, robots resembling children. Now, the thought is, well, at least they won't be attacking real children. Do we think it's somehow OK to have sex with these paedophile robots? Instinctively and intuitively, I've no better words than that. No, I don't think we do. There's something corrupt about the thought. And it's here that, that I think sexual morality begins. The thought that certain thoughts and corrupts are intrinsically, uh, and desires are intrinsically corrupt. 
And it's a terribly complex issue to negotiate and, and to work out. But I think it's there that we need to, to, to focus our thoughts when it comes to sex robots, particularly when it comes to intimacy and personal, the, the, the failure to build up um, proper virtues, if you like. Thank you very much. I was remembering, I actually chaired some panels on a robotics conference in Moscow, which was a bilingual conference. And due to some rather quirky translation, all the English people in the audience <laughs> cracked up at one point when this roboticist, who was doing remarkable work with extremely lifelike humanoid robots, announced that uh, women in future wouldn't want to uh, marry men who would drink beer and go to the football because they would marry one of his robots, which was a lifelike in every respect, the arms, the legs, the wedding vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm happy to what all the women present said, Actually, no, we, we, we still, you know, even with the football and the beer and everything, we, we still like a, a, a human being, it, at least until we find out what wedding vegetables are. Very good. <laughs> um, I think we can't hold back the tide of technology, and so banning it's not going to achieve anything, but we can use it constructively. And ultimately, we're very good at being human, we're very good at falling in love with other humans and having sex with other humans. And I don't think that's going to change, but I think we can use technology to bring pleasure where we might not be getting enough of it. Thank you. The ancient Greeks uh, were able to divide um, human knowledge and progress between technis and telos. What can we do and what should we do? <laughs> and since that era, only one of those has been pursued with any kind of vigour and has <laughs> invariably won out. And it is obviously the former. And the, uh, the sex robot will be no different. <laughs> yeah, I I'm very sceptical of futuristic predictions about what will happen. I have no idea whether these sex robots really will come to be. They might be like those ridiculous 1960s predictions about the year 2000, when we're all going to stop eating food and wear spacesuits. I mean, nobody actually knows. I think human, human wickedness and folly and knavery is pretty much constant throughout life. We'll find it'll manifest itself in new ways. Uh, sex robots per se, it's very hard to know what the, the mor moral dimensions are, but what worries me, I think, is to, to do with the, the stunting of, of growth and of um, the emotion, interpersonal emotions like care and concern and love and gratitude. That, and the whole point of these objects may well be to, uh, to, to stunt the, the growth of the virtues that, that make those things possible. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. And to all of you. <laughs>